سورة المباركة الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله بارئ الخلائق الأجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد والصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذلومين لا سيما ولي الله الأعظم حجة الله ابن الحسن صاحب الأمر والزمان اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد روحي وعرواح العالمين له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب الغرباء يا مذلوب كربلاء السلام على أن جعل الله الشفاء في تربته السلام على من الإجابة تحت كبته السلام على ساكن كربلاء فيا ليتنا ثم يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي يا سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أما بعد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله اصطفى آدم ونوحا وآل إمران وآل إبراهيم على العالمين صدق الله العلي العظيم وآمنا به زينوا مجالسكم بذكر محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Second of your loudest salawat in honor of Imam صاحب الأمر والزمان اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد The event of Karbala being one of the most powerful events in history with the potential to
to overthrow, not only to overthrow governments across the passage of time, not only to overthrow despots who rule in the name of religion over a passage of time, but Karbala is an event through which Sayyid al-Shuhada was able to conquer the hearts of the people, regardless of age, regardless of time, regardless of faith. And therefore, when a person, when a person analyzes and evaluates the potential of the tragedy of Karbala, the potential that it has over the ability for a person to change and embrace the right path, naturally you will find that historians who have always been against Ahlul Bayt will attack the tragedy of Karbala from a number of perspectives. And because of the energy and the potential energy that it wells, you will naturally find that those who are from the Mukhalifin, from the enemies, will try and attack Karbala and the issues surrounding the event of Karbala to try and diminish the divinity of this tragedy. One of the ways in which historians have come and have tried to create waswasa or balbala in the event of Karbala is by taking the mawqif or the stance of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya where they would come round and they would say that if Imam al Hussein was on the right path, why didn't Muhammad ibn Hanafiya join Imam al Hussein in the Battle of Karbala? Why is it that he did not fight with Imam al Hussein? Why is it that he did not accompany him to Makkah al mukarrama So they tried to use the stance of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya or the position of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya to show that there were disagreements and discord within the family of Bani Hashim. They used the stance of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya to show or to prove that the path of Ali Muhammad and the path chosen by Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein is not necessarily the right path. This is one form of accusation. The other form of accusation is an attack on the personality of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya himself, where they say that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was not courageous enough to go into war. He did not have that iman and that taqwa which was required by the companions of Imam al Hussein, and therefore he lost out on martyrdom. Both these accusations are wrong in the right of Muhammad Hanafiya or in defense of Muhammad Han ibn Hanafiya, and we shall try to evaluate these two situations and try and defend the honor of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya within the limits of the time and the limits of the research that I've been able to conduct. Number one, when it comes to the iman, the taqwa, and the courage of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, it is sufficient for a person to look through the life history of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya and the contributions that he made towards protecting the wilaya of Ali Muhammad. You will find that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was the flag bearer of Amir al muminin in the battle of Jamal as well as the battle of Siffin. When Amir al muminin comes out into war, this is not any normal ruler that is coming out of war. Rasulullah on the day of Khandak in honor of Amir al muminin If you may recall the battle of Khandak when Amr ibn Abduwad crosses the trench, he comes into Medina, into the city of Medina. The historians tell us that Amr ibn Abduwad was the equivalent of a thousand horsemen. Not only was his reputation in war a source of intimidation within the hearts of the opponent, but his physical size was intimidating. The ahadith tell us that the size of Amr ibn Abduwad was five shibr. Can you imagine a person whose width was five spans between the thumb and the finger? How wide do you think it must be? Definitely as wide as the member, if not more. A person this wide and this big in size, such that when he came to strike Amir al Mu'minin, when they stood for a duel, when he struck Amir al Mu'minin on the head, Amir al Mu'minin describes this hit and he describes the intensity of this hit. He says, I felt as if a mountain has come upon me. 
Who is saying this? Amirul Mu'mineen. For you can imagine the strength of Amr ibn Abdul Wad. In any case, when Amirul Mu'mineen is coming into the battlefield, and Amr ibn Abdul Wad has called out to the Muslims, which one of you from the followers of Muhammad has the ability or has the courage to face me? The traditions tell us all the Muslims were quiet, not one of the Ashab came forward. Amr ibn Wad calls out for a second time, is there anyone who has the courage to challenge me? Is there anyone who righteously claims to be the son of his mother and his father who can come out and challenge me? The Ashab are quiet. The third time Amr ibn Wad calls out, if you believe in Jannah and in Jahannam, in Jannah and Nar, in Jannah and Jahannam, fire, hellfire and heaven. He says, come out and fight me. If I kill you, you are going to Jannah. If you kill me, you will send me to Jahannam. What are you scared of? He came into Medina mocking the Ashab. Not one of them had the conviction to face Amr ibn Abdul Wad, except Amirul Mu'mineen. The tradition tells us when Ras Amir al Mu'mineen asked for permission twice. Rasulullah said, Sit down. The third time, when Rasulullah sees that the Ashab are filled with fear, and the Quran talks about this, their souls had come to their throat because they saw death in front of them. At this crucial point, Amir al Mu'mineen stands up for a third time. Rasulullah gives him permission. The narrations tell us that Rasulullah tied the amama around the helmet for Amir al Mu'mineen, a nine robe amama. He gives him his sword and he puts his hands out in prayers. He raises his hands in prayers. He says, Ya Allah, in the battle of Badr, you took my cousin Harith. In the battle of Uhud, you took my uncle Hamza. Ya Allah, if you want to be worshipped on the plains of this earth, then you give my cousin Ali victory. Yani meaning what? If Amir al-Mu'mineen was not victorious on the day of Khaybar or on the day of Khandak, Allah would not be worshipped on earth. And when he comes out into the battlefield, Rasulullah makes a statement. Kad barazal iman kulla ala kufri kulli. He says for Amir al Mu'mineen, Kad barazal iman, Kad barazal iman kullu. Yani Amir al Mu'mineen is the mazhar of iman in its entirety. From the time of Rasulullah till the day of judgment, whenever Amirul Mu'mineen comes out into war, he is the manifestation of Iman in its entirety. <laughs> ya Ali, for whether it is the battle of Badr, Ahad, Khandak, Khaybar, Ali is the nishan or Ali is the alama of Iman. Similarly, in the battle of Jamal, when Amir al-Mu'mineen comes out, in the battle of Siffin, when Amir al-Mu'mineen comes out, this is the alama of Iman that is coming out. Who is the flag bearer of the manifestation of Iman in its entirety? Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. Look at the value and the status of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. It is not something adi, it is not something normal to be given the flag, the raya to be the commander of the army of Amir al Mu'mineen. For Muhammad ibn Hanafiya in the battle of Jamal and Siffin was the flag bearer of the army that represents Iman in its entirety. How can a person doubt in the courage of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya and come forward with useless or baseless allegations that he was not courageous enough to join Imam al Hussein? The traditions tell us that in one of the attacks that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya conducted in the battle of Siffin, he had penetrated into the army so deep and his attack was so staunch. The people didn't know how to respond to Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. They would run away. But when they would run away, they saw this is not enough. Muhammad ibn Hanafiya is persistent in his attack. They would turn around and they would try to use psychological warfare. 
They would come to Muhammad ibn Hanafiya from behind the ranks, from a distance. They would shout to him and they would tell him, Oh Muhammad, your father does not love you. Muhammad ibn Hanafiya stood for a moment. He said, what makes you think this? He says, if your father would have loved you, he would not have sent you into the middle of the battlefield and into the jaws of death. He would have sent Hassan and Hussein. Perhaps your father does not love you as he loves Hassan and Hussein. And in the reply of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, you see the taqwa and the iman that is beaming in his heart. He says to the enemy, Hassan and Hussein are like the two eyes of Ali ibn Abi Talib and I am like the hand of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Whenever there is a danger towards the eyes of a person, he covers it with his hands. I am that hand of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. Peak of courage. And the children of Haidar al-Karrar. The same Muhammad ibn Hanafiya who stood by Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba when the ceasefire took place between Imam al-Mujtaba and Muawiyah. For there is no doubt when it comes to the Iman and the courage of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. The question that comes, the second delegation, to counter the second delegation, why is it that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya did not join Imam al Hussein in Karbala? The answer is twofold or threefold, but when you look at these answers collectively, you see that there is a hikmah ilahiyya behind this. The first answer is that <coughs> Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was commanded by Imam al Hussein himself to remain in Medina. And this is absolutely clear from the conversation that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya has with Imam al Hussein when they are leaving Medina. As you know from history, that when Imam al Hussein is leaving Medina, he bids farewell to the grave of Rasulullah, to the shrine of Rasulullah, he bids farewell to his mother Sayyidah Zahra, he bids farewell to Umm Salama. And then he bids farewell to Muhammad Hanafiya, Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. The traditions tell us that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya showed his concern for Imam al Hussein. The conversation that took place between Muhammad ibn Hanafiya and Sayyid al Shuhada is recorded in the books of history. Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was not receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way Imam al Hussein was receiving revelation. Or inspiration, when we say revelation, not that if this lecture is online, then the Salafis or the Wahhabis will come and say that we have put in another Quran. La, not revelation by means of wahi, but inspiration and guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was not receiving this inspiration or this revelation. For the nasiha that he gave to Imam al Hussein was the most sincere nasiha that a person would be able to come up with in the absence of revelation and inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he tells his brother Imam al Hussein, naturally, you are the Imam of your time. He says to him, Oh, my master. Why do you not go to the lands of Yemen? As you know, majority of the tribes in Yemen had become Shia at the hands of Amir al muminin So he says, why do you not go from Yemen? And what we understand from the text of the conversation is that Muhammad Hanafiya actually supported Imam al Hussein in the uprising with Yazid, against Yazid. Rather, Muhammad ibn Hanafiya thought that perhaps for Imam al Hussein, the best place to start the revolution and the best place to gather the momentum would be from Yemen. And Muhammad ibn Hanafiya cannot be blamed for this because he's making a suggestion or he's giving a nasiha and advice to the best possible capability outside the realm of inspiration. Which is why then Imam al Hussein says to him, Brother, I know you love me, and I know that the advice you have given me is from the sincerity of your heart. But then what does he tell him? Sha'Allahu an yarani katila. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed that I should be sacrificed and martyred. 
And over here, Imam al Hussein shows to Muhammad ibn Hanafiya that the stance that I'm taking is one of or one that is been revealed and inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he commands Muhammad ibn Hanafiya to remain in Medina. The text of the conversation that goes on between Imam al Hussein and Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, this can be found perhaps in Maktal Abu Mikhnaf. And if not in Maktal al-Mukarram for sure. Imam al Hussein says to him, to Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, Ya Akhi, Jazakallah khayran lakad nasahta wa asharta bis sawab. Imam al Hussein says to Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, Jazakallah, may Allah reward you. You have advised me in the most sincere way and you have given me the best of advice. وَأَنَا عَازِمٌ عَلَى الْخُرُوجِ إِلَى الْمَكَّةِ But I'm determined, I'm determined that I should leave towards Mecca. وَكَدْ تَحَيَّأْتُ لِذَلِكَ وَأَنَا وَإِخْوَتِي وَبَنُوا أَخِي وَشِيعَتِي أَمْرُهُمْ أَمْرِي وَرَأْيُهُمْ رَأْيِي My family members, my brothers and their family and their Shias, their view is my view. Or my view is their view and my affair is their affair. بعد he says to Muhammad Hanafiya, وَأَمَّا أَنْتْ فَلَا عَلَيْكَ أَنْ تُكِيمْ بِالْمَدِينَةِ I want you, because this is a very eloquent way in which the sentence or the statement is made, فَلَا عَلَيْكَ أَنْ تُكِيمْ بِالْمَدِينَةِ Basically, what is understood by the ulama of grammar and the ulama of Balagha is that Imam al Hussein, in a very eloquent manner, commands Imam al Hussein to remain in Medina. Fala alayka antukim bil Medina. Why? Fatakunu li aynan alayhim. La takhfa anni shay'an min umurihim. I want you to remain in Medina. Such that you can be my eyes and my ears in Medina while I am in Mecca. And there should not be a single political affair or social affair that happens in Medina except that you should convey these messages and this information to me. Imam al Hussein remained in Mecca for how long? He left at the end of Shahrul Rajab. The traditions tell us he reached Shahr, he reached Mecca in Shahru Shaaban, fourth or fifth of Shaaban. So he remained in Mecca for Shaaban, Shahru Shaaban, Shahru Ramadan, Shahru Shawwal, Dil Qad, Dil Hijjah. On the day of Arafah, according to majority of the traditions, he left Mecca to go towards Kufa. So for how many? Close to five months. Imam al Hussein spent his time in Mecca. Forming political allies, gathering people from across the entire globe who have come for Umrah and Hajj towards his support and exposing the enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the form of Yazid. For naturally, if Imam al Hussein is in Mecca and you know that the distance between Mecca and Medina is not so great. Whatever happens in Mecca politically, economically, and socially affects Medina as well. For it was imperative for Imam al Hussein to have an aid who is trustworthy and reliable in Medina to give him news of what is happening around him while the Imam is based in Mecca. Just in the same way that Sayyid al Shuhada sent Muslim bin Akil, Rahmatullah alayhi, to Kufa. As his safir, as his ambassador, he needed to have an aid that was there in Medina to take care of the affairs and give him the news and information that is happening there. This was the role that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen for Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. This is one answer or one dimension. Another dimension, Sayyid ibn Tawus in his maktal, narrates the region and Sheikh al darmandi as well, together with Alama al-Hairi, all three of these leading historians when it comes to the issue of the maktal, they are known collectively as the Arbab al-Makatil. 
يعني the the if you translate it clear uh, literally the lords of the maktal those people who spent a lot of effort in gathering precise information in regards to the event of Imam al Hussein, including Alamat Tabarsi from the later who later on came and uh, made public their writings and went through a lot of research, they are of the opinion, or rather they were able to establish that Muhammad ibn Hanafiyya was not able to join Imam al Hussein on his journey to Karbala because he was afflicted by a sickness that had literally made him paralyzed. The hadith doesn't say paralyzed, but what we understand from the tradition is that the sickness that had overcome Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was such that he was not able to walk with ease. He was not able to even hold a sword. So his sickness had made him an exception. Why? Just like the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed for the deen of Islam to continue and for imamat to continue through a sickness which was bestowed on Imam Zainul Abideen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished that they should be supporters from Bani Hashim who will support the cause of Imam al Hussein and support the imamat of Imam Zainul Abideen, but they should be protected by a way of sickness. For in the same way Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was exempted. Allah protected his life through a sickness such that he can support the wilaya and the imama of Imam Zainul Abideen. On one hand, and on number two, such that he can be the voice of the revolution of Imam al Hussein. What is the proof of this? A few weeks back, we said in the majlis of Imam Sajjad, salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi, That Imam al Hussein had left his wasiya with a number of people. He didn't give his wasiya to one person as was the norm, the way Rasulullah did with Amir and the way Amir did with Imam al Hassan. He left a part of the wasiya with Umm Salama. He left a part of his wasiya with his daughter Fatima al Kubra. He left a part of his wasiya with Sayyida Zainab. He left a part of his wasiya with Imam al-Sajjad. He left a part of his wasiya with Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. What was this wasiya? Again, the historians then mention, when Imam al Hussein is leaving from Medina towards Makkah, he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. هذا ما أوصى به الحسين بن علي إلى أخيه محمد بن حنفية. This is the وصية of حسن بن علي to his brother محمد بن حنفية. أن الحسين يشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمد عبده ورسوله جاء بالحق من عنده وأن الجنة حق والنار حق. Imam al Hussein says, I, Hussein, bear witness that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he has no partner. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma swalli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Is his slave and his messenger. He came with truth from his Lord. Wa anna al jannata haq. Jannah is haq. Nar is haq, similar to what we recite in the Talkeen. وَالسَّاعَةَ آتِيَةٌ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهَا The day of judgment is surely to come upon us and there is no doubt in it. وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ يَبْعَثُ مَنْ فِي الْكُبُورِ Allah will raise those who are from the graves. وَإِنِّي لَمْ أَخْرِجُ أَشَرًّا وَلَا بَتْرًا وَلَا مُفْسِدًا وَلَا ظَالِمًا وَإِنَّمَا خَرَجْتُ لِطَلَبِ الْإِسْلَاحِ فِي أُمَّةِ جَدِّي أُرِيدُ أَنْ أَعْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَأَنْهِي عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأَسِيرْ بِسِيرَةِ جَدِّي وَأَبِي عَلِي بْنَ عَبِي طَالِبْ He says in his wasiyah, I am not coming out to create mischief, neither have I come out to cause fasad, neither am I coming out as an oppressor. 
Rather, I am coming out to seek or to reform the ummah of my grandfather and to walk in the seerah of my father, Amirul Mu'mineen. Tayyib, if you look at this part of the wasiyah, what is this part of the wasiyah? Imam al Hussein is leaving Medina to go towards Mecca. He is outlining the mission statement of his entire uprising. The entire mission statement of Imam al Hussein is spelled out in three or four sentences, which he has left with Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, saying that the whole reason why I'm coming out in the revolution is to reform the ummah of Rasulullah and to walk in the seerah of Rasulullah and in the seerah of my grandfather, Amir al Mu'mineen. Why does Imam al Hussein leave his mission statement as a wasiyah for his brother? If his brother was not on haq or his brother was against him. The wasiyah was given to Muhammad ibn Hanafiya so that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya can stand up with tabligh and ensure that the entire Muslim ummah will know the reasons for which Imam al Hussein was killed in Karbala. This was the role that was given to Muhammad ibn Hanafiya by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was the efforts of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya and his protests that ensured that the likes of Abdullah ibn Zubair do not come and take the Khilafah at the expense of the blood of Imam al Hussein. It is Muhammad ibn Hanafiya who very tactfully came out and showed the people that the real Imama after Karbala lies with Imam Zainul Abidin. How? After Karbala, it is narrated once that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was in Medina and he was claiming the imamat for himself. And historians have claimed, have blamed Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. They say that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was competing with the imamat with Imam Zainul Abidin. He was out, correct. Muhammad ibn Hanafiya called out for imama. But then one year when they went for Hajj, the people said, or the close Shias came, they said, Ya Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, you call for Imama. And at the same time, Imam Zainul Abidin, the son of Imam al Hussein, also calls for Imama. Which one of you is true? Muhammad ibn Hanafiya says, both of us will come to the Kaaba. Both of us will make our claim and we will see who is right. Muhammad ibn Hanafiya comes and Imam Zainul Abidin comes. The entire Hijaz in the Mawsam of Hajj, Millions of people, even at that time, there were millions who used to come for Hajj. Not only now. The tradition say millions used to come. Millions of people are there at the Kaaba, watching two people who are claiming imamat for themselves. Imam Zainul Abidin says, let the Hajar al-Aswad decide and attest to which one of us is the real imam. The traditions tell us that the Hajar al-Aswad spoke out in a voice that was given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it said that the imamat is for Ali ibn al-Hussein Zainul Abideen. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. People think that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was competing for imama for himself. These people are shallow minded. What Muhammad ibn Hanafiya did is that in a very smart and in a very tactful manner, he opened the door for people to realize the imamat of Imam Zainul Abidin. Had he not called out for imama as a drama or as a scheme, he would never have had the opportunity to invite millions of people in front of the Kaaba and make sure that the Hajar al-Aswad bears witness for Imam Zainul Abideen. Look at how tactful Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was. How honorable Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was. But history has done injustice to him. Ahibai, as we approach the days of Arba'een, we honor and we grieve for the women of Ahlul Bayt. <coughs> the traditions tell us that on the day of Arba'een, when the ladies reached Karbala al Muqaddas, in what way did the ladies reach? 
the ladies have reached Karbala, as we said yesterday, heartbroken with grief, covered in injuries from the whips and the beatings that they received in the prisons of Sham and Kufa, carrying this and on their journey. The traditions mention for us that when the ladies reached Karbala, all the ladies came off their camels and they ran towards the grave of Imam al Hussein. Some of the ladies would be sitting on the grave of Hussein crying, Oh father, oh father. There would be other women sitting on the grave crying, Oh my brother, oh my brother. There would be another group of women who would be crying by the grave, Oh my husband, oh my husband. Some of them would go to the grave of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and they would cry at his grave, Oh uncle. Yani, the tradition mentions that all the women who came to Karbala, each one of them had a grave to cry on and each one would be weeping at a particular grave except one little girl. There was a little girl who was sitting away from the graves and her head was on her knees. She was sitting on the desert sands and weeping bitterly. The tradition mentions that the narrator went to this little girl and he said to her, Oh little girl, are you not crying at the grave of your father? Is Hussein not your father? Why do you not cry on his grave? The little girl looked up at him. This little girl's name was Hamida. Hamida says, Oh man, this is correct. This is my uncle's grave. But till today I am a yatim and I have not seen the grave of my father. They asked her, who is your father? This little girl, Hamida, says, I am the daughter of Muslim bin Akil. She says to him, today we shall honor Muslim bin Akil and his daughter, Hamida. Hamida says, oh, she goes to Auntie Zainab. She says, oh, Auntie Zainab, every one of the Aitam, it is the hak of a Yatima that they can go to the grave of their fathers and they can cry cry for them. But Auntie Zainab, till today I don't know where the grave of my father Muslim is. In what way my father was killed. The traditions mention that Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad al took Muslim bin Akil to the top of the Qasr. And he pushed him down. First they struck the head of Muslim bin Akil. After they pushed, struck his head, they threw the body of Muslim from the top of Qasr al the narrator mentions that when the body of Muslim fell to the ground, we heard the bones on his body break. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon wa la'anatullah ala kawmid dalimeen matumih Hussein. Kabirai hai Zainab, aya hai Madina. Kabirai hai Zainab, aya hai Madina. Labrez hai ghamse.